Good morning, members. It's time to get started with a formal quorum, so I call the meeting to order now. Members, we have a long agenda today, so please uh, manage our time to, uh, properly. First item confirmation of minutes of the previous meeting held on. The previous occasion, on the 25th of April, no proposed amendment has been proposed. Uh, item two, information paper issued since the last meeting. We have a letter from Mr. Lam Chak Ting. Mr. Lam Chak Ting. Yes. Yeah, so some members might not have uh, read the letter. It's, it arises from uh, a previous uh, question raised by me. I uh, have c come to uh, n notice that uh, the uh, police force uh, uh, accepted uh, a single sum of fifteen million dollars in donation to uh, uh, its uh, staff association. I think this is a matter of concern, and members should equally be concerned. All right, you have sent a letter to the administration. Let's uh, wait for a reply, and if necessary, we can uh, put the matter on the list of outstanding items. Uh, if uh, needed, we uh, we can uh, have another agenda item on this. Is it is it on the list already? No, I wait for the reply from the administration first. Uh, are we not going to make a decision today? Well, the usual practice for me is to wait for the reply from the administration first to see whether we should have put uh, the matter uh, on the agenda. All right, date of next meeting and uh, items for discussion. Please refer to the list of um, Outstanding items of discussion. The next meeting is going to be held on the 6th of June at 2.30 p.m. Uh, three items have been proposed from the uh, government. First, comprehensive review of the strategy of handling loan reform and claims in initial legislative proposal. Sec second item, uh, counter-terrorism. Uh, and also, thirdly, rehabilitation and community work of the CST. Mr. Mr. Cotemo, uh, certain exiled uh, dignitary of the, the uh, mainland, uh, Mr. Guotman Gui, uh, gave an interview and uh, disclosing certain uh, sensitive. Uh, Information on uh, how the mainland uh, operatives uh, did things in Hong Kong. I think we should ask the Security Bureau, Sec Secretary for Security, uh, to respond to those uh, allegations. Perhaps uh, we should have an item on the sixth of June. I know. I know you have uh, already sent in a request to the House Committee Chairman uh, for an urgent question to be raised on the same subject. I believe that the matter will be uh, brought up for discussion in the FC this afternoon. But so uh, since we have a rather the busy schedule, well, if the question is allowed by the FC, then there will be no need for the um, uh, subject to be uh, discussed in this uh, panel. Uh, but if it's not allowed, perhaps uh, we can uh, then uh, take it from there and decide what to do about it in our future meetings. So we are going to handle non-refoulement claims, anti-terrorism, uh, which are two. Matters uh, which a lot of uh, members will be concerned about. Uh, don't, don't, do you think that uh, f three items would be too much? Uh, no. Okay, we have three items for the next meeting. Item number four. Progress on implementation of new immigration control systems. 
Uh, please invite the officials to join us now. I'll ask the administration to brief us first before I proceed to a Q&A session. For this item, we have the foreign officials, Mr. John Lee Kanchu, Under Secretary for Security, Mr. Parson Lam Chun Robbins, Assistant Secretary for Security, Mr. Raymond Lord Whiteman, Assistant Director, Immigration Department, Mr. Tai Chi Yun, Assistant Director, Immigration Department. They are all here. So, um, Under Secretary, can you walk us through the paper, please? Well, today we're here to brief members on the latest progress of the implementation of the uh, new immigration control system by the immigration department in 2016 the number of no number of passengers uh, was uh, comparable to the figure for 2015 which is uh, 148 million people and uh, this year uh, there was an uh, 1.7 increase of 37 million people coming to hong kong in the first quarter and we have registered a three percent increase of visitors, and that that is a uh, fourteen million in the first quarter. To cope with the large volume of uh, passengers, the uh, immigration department has introduced various measures, including a new system, uh, a new computer system for control points, and that is uh, the new immigration control system icons that we are going to brief members about. And they, also, they have also improved other immigration control uh, procedures. In 2010 March, uh, this council gave approval to the introduction of the uh, new system that we are going to talk about. There are three phases to it. The first is to improve the e-channels, and then uh, then uh, the second one is to the improve the so-called express entry exit processing record system and the third item the the automated passengers and vehicle clearance system the, the third two phases have been already been completed and they could involve the uh, improving of uh, software and and hardware and uh, the e channels are turned into multifunctional the e channels and uh, 158 more e-channels uh, have been installed. Uh, there are more than 500 uh, installed in various control points, or 35 percent increase over the past. In the third phase, uh, which will be implemented in the current financial year, the immigration department will use a phase recognition technology and also elect, and, uh, in conjunction with electronic travel documents, to enhance clearance efficiency and improve. Passenger clearance, the immigration department for with uh, at their counters make use of face recognition technology to assist immigration officers to guide, confirm their identity identity more effectively to the prevent uh, imposters and also the people which, who which may pose risk to Hong Kong. For departure, the self service departure clearance will be launched for. Visitors age 11 or above holding valid ETDs comply with the ICAO's requirements to perform to perform self-service departure clearance through e-channels without prior enrollment, and their identities will be authenticated by the face recognition technologies at e-channels. The initiative will be rolled out by FACES starting from 2017 in all control points, and the Hong Kong International Airport control point will be the first to undergo the pilot run. The Immigration Department is now testing the system to ensure its reliability and smoothness when it comes into operation. Apart from enhancing the computer systems, the Immigration Department will continue to enhance the efficiency and the convenience of the clearing systems, including countries assigning uh, agreements with um, countries with frequent liaison with Hong Kong for reciprocal use of automated immigration clearance service and the use of mobile applications for visitors to obtain information uh, on the uh, rating time at major land boundary control points. I'll be happy to take questions from members. We have five members indicating they wish to ask questions. Ma Fung Kwok, Chen Chen Ying, 
Pun Siu Peng, uh, Charles Mock, Lam Chuck Ting, Claude Yemo, four minutes each. Let's start with Mr. Ma Fung Kwok. Thank you. Chairman. I'd like to refer to paragraph 10A of the paper. Starting from 2017-18 at Hong Kong International Airport, it will be uh, the pilot run for the, the adoption of face recognition technology. So will the face recognition technology be adopted at all check-in counters at the airport or that only some counters will have the face recognition technology whereas others will um, rely, continue to rely on the authentication by fingerprint and ID, uh, or and ID documents. And if the face recognition technology cannot allow smooth um, customs clearance, then what will be the uh, remedy? Will there be um, Will the authentication be done manually? And this will be the first phase, right? Uh, and also for the f second phase, which, le uh, which boundary control points will adopt the face recognition technology or will all um, BCPs be adopting the technology? Under Secretary, I will just first explain the concept and then I will defer to the Immigration Department to explain the operational details. This new technology or the new measures are for um, holders of foreign passports. Once they have arrived in Hong Kong, when they leave the territory, they can adopt the um, face recognition technology to leave Hong Kong, and there will be new e-channels for these visitors. Whereas for the e-channels for Hong Kong residents, we have not made any change. The new e-channels are set up for holders of foreign passports and face recognition technology will be adopted. But on arrival, there won't be any self-service arrangement. They will need to go through the uh, check-in procedure at the counters on departure. Uh, if they encounter problems, then of course the staff of the Immigration Department will uh, tend to the case and if necessary inquiries will be made. And I can defer to the Assistant Director for um, uh, operational details. About the first phase, the arrangement is that in the airport all e channels will be installed with video cameras for the adoption of face recognition technology. After installing cameras, well, at the BCPs, we, are, we already have multi-purpose e-channels. And then we will gauge the passenger traffic pattern and passenger flow to decide how many of these e-channels will be put to use. Because we have changed all the e-channels to multi-purpose e-channels, our frontline staff can therefore deploy the um, or redistribute the use of uh, multi-purpose e-channels depending on uh, passenger flow. So Hong Kong residents themselves will not be using this system because for Hong Kong residents, we use the uh, template stored in the smart ID card for authentication of their identities. Whereas for the face adoption technology, this is a uh, face recognition technology. This is mainly for, for visitors holding foreign passports to expedite the customs clearance as they depart from Hong Kong. And the face recognition technology will not be used on Hong Kong residents. Mr. Ronick Chen, according to the paper, starting from next year, the next generation of ID card will uh, come into force and about replacement of ID cards, does the government have any uh, timetable on the use of um, e-travel documents? And according to the paper, the government has emphasized on expediting the um, arrival and departure clearance procedures. However, apart from Checking the ID documents, one important element of departure and arrival clearance is security check. But 
I understand that the security check is not undertaken by the government department, but by a security company of the airport. Whereas for land BCPs, the security check is conducted by the government department. So uh, as the clearance procedure is expedited, I see a um, tailback at the uh, or a queue at the security check counters. Of course, it is important for ensuring passenger safety. Now, on the one hand, you may have sped up the uh, clearance procedure, but will you also consider expediting the security checks so as to um, do away with the queue? About the next generation smart ID card, I'll defer to. Uh, my colleague to take your question, but in relation to the um, arrival, departure, clearance and security checks, these are two different systems. We need to comply with the ICAO's requirements on the che uh, on the checks at a the airport and we are confident uh, regarding the airport's efficient system. Whereas for other BCPs, we have uh, given the consideration on giving support, and that is why uh, the Hong Kong International Airport will be the uh, pilot um, run, and then we will review the effectiveness of uh, the arrangement. And I thank Mr. Chen for his comment. Of course, for other BCPs, we will um, give due consideration. And about the um, e-travel documents, I'll defer to Mr. Locke to take your question. In 2007, we introduced the first generation ETD. And last April, we sought approval from the Finance Committee to develop the second generation ETD. In the middle of 2019, we expect the system to be introduced, and this is the timetable. We have issued tender briefs to contractors to invite for tender. Well, do you have a timetable, roughly when it will be? Assistant Director. It will be around March 2019 when the new system will be launched. All right, that's all for me, Mr. Pencil Peng. Thank you, Chairman. Well, just now, Under Secretary mentioned that we have over 140 million visitors entering Hong Kong every year, and of course, I see that there is a bar chart in the annex showing the number of arriving passengers per year. About visitors using uh, counters and also e-channels, I want to know the uh, ratio. And uh, of course, we have um, passengers and visitors coming into the territory. Then the second question about the face recognition technology. And you mentioned that uh, this is for visitors. Well, I want to know whether the face recognition technology will be adopted at other uh, BCPs. And also in 2019, we approved the funding application of um, $900 million for the ICONS, ICONS and uh, for the first phase and second phase of ICONS, and I want to know whether the funding is sufficient for implementing this arrangement. Under Secretary, thank you for the three questions. Let me first take your third question. When we apply for funding with the Finance Committee, we already took into account the third phase of ICONS, and in, according to the consultancy report, uh, on enhancing the overall management of the de arrival and departure clearance system. We took on board the views of the consultant and the funding already took into account all three phases. So the funding is sufficient. About, uh, and about the uh, question on the ratio about mainland visitors accounting for the largest proportion of overall visitors. 40% of them use e-channels, 60% of them used counters. 
as for the uh, uses of e-channels, the majority of uses are Hong Kong residents. And that's one visitor to 13 Hong Kong residents using e-channels. So I think Hong Kong residents um, uh, benefited the most from the introduction of e-channels. On the question of whether the mainland BCPs also use face recognition technology, I don't have this information. I don't know whether the assistant director, Mr. Locke, uh, has anything to add. To my understanding, the for the airport in the capital, uh, the uh, for the e-channels, they also use the face recognition technology. Face recognition technology is also used by a lot of countries in Europe for quite some time. In Australia, uh, they're using the same technology as well. Anything to add, Mr. Poon? On manpower arrangement, let's say if we adopt the face recognition technology, do we need to increase or reduce manpower? Do you have any estimate? And the Secretary. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Poon. According to our estimate, the face recognition technology will only enhance our uh, efficiency and effectiveness in conducting risk assessments in the sense that we will be more confident and there will be more data available for handling cases and it will not have a major impact on our manpower arrangement. There will be no change as far as manpower is concerned. Mr. Charles Mock, thank you, Chairman. Just now, I was on a TV program and I was talking about the use of uh, fingerprint in our, on our mobile phones, and the host uh, asked me to explain uh, with the aid of uh, e-channels. So e-channels are really familiar to Hong Kong people, I think, over a decade or two. In terms of uh, actual application of technology by the government, we have adopted this technology a long time ago, and it has been working well. I think in terms of the system, we need to look at the speed, accuracy, and also security. For some government systems, such as the immigration department systems, say um, the ID card, well, um, the system will have to be replaced after some time. So at least in terms of icons, I think that instead of um, a total replacement of the system after some time, it can be done in phases. Say uh, you, sh you can have partial replacement of the system instead of a total replacement. So this should ensure the only the minimum minimal disruption will be caused. Are you going to do the same for our immigration control system? In other, in other countries, uh, they may have uh, tried to. In other departments, that uh, they would try to do something new, but uh, then uh, they would come up uh, with uh, something that cannot be implemented for more than a decade or so, and then they would come for urgent funding. In this council. <laughs> So are you going to make sure that this is not going to happen? And are there anything new in the international scene that you would like to adopt uh, in the next stage, uh, for example, cloud uh, services? Apart from face recognition technology, do you want to uh, adopt uh, newer technology in the future, in the future phases? Under Secretary, let me uh, answer questions uh, about uh, policies and uh, concepts, and I ask Mr. Law to say something about uh, uh, enforcement and uh, management, and also uh, discussion that are taking place internationally. We would like the uh, 
the system to to have a lifespan of uh, at least ten years. Uh, of course, I agree with Mr. Moore that the uh, aim is to cause uh, as little disruption as possible, as little uh, inconvenience to the public as as possible. But uh, computer technology uh, is developing very rapidly. If there's new technology or new system available, which uh, in our assessment is more uh, effective, of course, uh, we'll look into adopting those. For law enforcement agencies and for the government, uh, the most important thing is to plan ahead. And uh, if there are new technologies uh, on in the market, we would uh, conduct early st stu studies as early as possible, and uh, try to incorporate uh, those uh, useful to, as soon as uh, practicable. Mr. Moore, can you tell us what is happening internationally? Well, we are paying much a lot of attention to the uh, management criteria of uh, e-passports. Uh, the things that are, that are being considered would include whether the chip uh, would also store the, um, clearance uh, information of at uh, various checkpoints. And the uh, ICAO, International Civil Aviation Organization, is uh, doing some study of, on this, and we would, uh, of course, uh, look towards uh, enhancement of system to tie in if this is uh, adopted internationally. An IB uh, with the relaxation of the e-channel service. How many people uh, will be uh, benefited? How many people have registered for the use of e-channels? Some 20 million people have done this. Well, the, on average, it's uh, 12 seconds for Hong Kong residents and 20 seconds for visitors. Is it because the database for visitors is much bigger than that for um, Hong Kong residents? Can you enhance your system? So that the gap between the two the, uh, time, the two processing time the records can be reduced. Well, for local residents, they will check the uh, the fingerprint. Uh, they will have their fingerprint checked against the template, and that's done. But for visitors, after verifying their identification, we need to in. Uh, Print out a tag to tell them the uh, the uh, period of stay in Hong Kong and also uh, if there's any condition. So that's why it takes a longer time to process a visitor's uh, clearance. And uh, for Hong Kong residents, uh, the information is checked against uh, his own document. That's a one-to-one. -one, uh, Matching, but uh, for a visitor, the information has to match with uh, the entry in the database. That's why it takes longer. You are going to adopt the face recognition technology in the first phase, and this will be done at the uh, airport's uh, airport. So if uh, you have registered for the e channel service, then there's no need to use the face that recognition technology because of the uh, lower risk for those who have registered. Is that a correct interpretation? Well, if they have a register for e channels, uh, then uh, the risk would have been assessed at that point. We we'll look at the uh, purpose of a visit, and uh, then uh, and then we gave uh, we'll give approval for the use of e channels. So the risk level is uh, similar to those using our counter service.
for the face recognition technology is uh, mainly for the purpose of preventing the imposter from using other people's passports. So this is an enhancement of uh, our system uh, in respect of th this. Some 20 million people visitors have registered for each channels. Why do you think that uh, the, the risk uh, associated with these visitors will, visitors will be uh, lower? Can they just use their e passport to enter Hong Kong? Or use the biometric characteristics uh, to verify the identification that is a fingerprint before they can uh, clear the e channels? In terms of reliability or accuracy, which is higher, the face recognition or fingerprint? Well, they are similar. According to the U.S. study, the two uh, biometric characteristics can all be used for the purpose of uh, identification. The accuracy level uh, levels are similar. Mr. Lam Chak Teng. I think uh, this new system will be uh, offered to visitors from all over the world, including mainland visitors and Macau visitors, I suppose. Correct, correct. Chairman, recently Macau authorities uh, repeatedly to refuse entry by Hong Kong residents, including some colleagues, some members of this council. And uh, the allegation is that uh, members of this council uh, pose a risk to their security. That's uh, most ridiculous and unreasonable. So I have a question for Under Secretary: Is this when while we ad as, as, uh, adopt this uh, new immigration control system? Are you going to going to screen uh, Macau visitors? Well, would you be ready to uh, screen out uh, security officials of, of uh, Macau, and they, they should be taken to a room for an interview for up to an hour, and then uh, rejected because of security risk? Well, we are bound by the uh, requirements set up by the ICAO. Our system would uh, comply with uh, the requirements, and the same system is used by New Zealand, Australia. Well, I'm not asking question a question about international standards, but this is related. When someone uh, enters Hong Kong or the Pass for Hong Kong. We have to the, clear the passengers to ensure that that uh, there's no uh, security uh, risk. Of course, uh, this is the, the technology side, but every country and every jurisdictions will have to consider whether to allow certain people to enter or leave uh, the jurisdiction. That's a question of legal system. So, in other words, under secretary, you allow the Macau authorities to unreasonably to refuse the entry of uh, members of this council and members of the public. Mr. Wan Siu Kin went to Macau with his family members, including children. How could he be a, a security risk to Macau? I think the security bureau should uh, speak out for Hong Kong people, including members of this council. Pressure should be brought to bear on uh, on Macau on the Macau authority. You cannot allow them to make such an unreasonable um, decision, and uh, you just keep your silence. That it, doing this will, will be failing Hong Kong people. Uh, I think the government should do something about uh, this unreasonable uh, practice. I, uh, Chairman. I want uh, the in the future new system. Uh, there should be data stored on uh, Macau security officials. I, I member members, uh, uh, please uh, 
we are still in a in a meeting. Please be silent. We can only do what is required under our laws. What Mr. Lam suggests is not something that we can do under our laws, uh, in, 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 and we are not allowed by the law to handle certain uh, people in a certain suggested way. Uh, we have a number of members who wish to speak. Uh, does do any other members wish to speak on this? Because we still have two more items to go. I'll draw a line here. Thank you, Mr. Otkodemo. Oh, this uh, item is on uh, the new immigration control system. We don't want to have this uh, tit for tat uh, arrangement for screening out uh, visitors. That may be difficult to achieve. But uh, Mr. Lam Cheng Ting's uh, remarks are somehow uh, st uh, uh, standing up to reason. So we are now uh, Hong Kong people are now at the mercy of uh, the. the Macau authority uh, on this side we we have all the victims uh, Mr. Chan Ji Chin went to sweep uh, a family grave and he was rejected uh, so shouldn't we be uh, assessing whether um, Macau officials coming to Hong Kong will pose a security risk uh, I won't I, I'm not trying to uh, Pressurize officials here. I know it's difficult for you to offer answers now. Some 20 million people have registered for e channels, not counting Hong Kong people. How many are? I think uh, are visitors. I believe uh, there are 13 million or so. How many of them uh, are mainland mainlanders? How do you recognize them or, or the uh, think by fingerprints? Or by face recognition, or they have already answered this question. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, please elaborate. Uh, I'll ask Mr. Lok to supplement uh, in terms of numbers. Uh, the uh, recognition is done by fingerprint. When you register for the use of e-channels, uh, you have to uh, give us your fingerprint uh, so as to. So as to uh, enhance recognition. Then, now please repeat the figure for Miss Claudia Mo about the number of mainland visitors registered. Don't say repeat the figure. I haven't heard him say that. Uh, as I said just now, about 20 million visitors registered. 19 million of them uh, are mainland visitors who have registered for the use of e-channels. 19 million mainland visitors. Oh, excluding Hong Kong residents, because Hong Kong residents are not required to be registered for e-channels, because you mentioned 20 million visitors, uh, passengers. I thought that it, you um, that included the Hong Kong residents. So Hong Kong residents are not required to be registered. They will automatically be eligible for e-channels. So we're talking about visitors from other countries. So when somebody uses the e-channel, it has nothing to do with face recognition technology. At the moment, only fingerprints will be used. Whereas if you go to a clearance counter, one will go through a normal clearance procedure. And then at the counter, the new face recognition technology won't be uh, applicable. Well, Mr. Lam Chuting, you're so tall, I can't, I can't see in front. Well, perhaps I should ask the members to remain in their seats. Assistant Director, um, all passengers will be able to use the clearance counters. I'm not trying to trick you, uh, but about the uh, sh um, the uh, sham shampoo boat incident, well, so far the Security Bureau hasn't been able to come up with a good explanation. If we have face recognition technology, then there won't be anybody smuggled out of the territory in the future. Any response? 
the face recognition technology. First of all, the first pilot run will happen at the Hong Kong International Airport, and then we will see how and if they will be implemented in other BCPs. Mr. Dr. Zheng Chungtai, my first question about this. The setting up of this new system, can you explain the concept to me? If we're talking about speeding up the clearance procedure, then then uh, do you have any data in relation to the previous systems, whether the clearance time has been shortened with more uh, with a higher utilization and uh, perhaps save costs as well, and also in terms of costs, we should not compromise security for the per for the um, sake of saving costs. Now, in the past, there were incidents of uh, people. Using disguise, facial disguise, to go through the border, and on those occasions, the immigration officers were able to um, recognize the disguise. Somebody disguising uh, himself as an old man trying to get across the border. Well, um, we are talking about uh, cosmetic surgery nowadays. is very popular not only in South Korea but also in the mainland China. Just look at the celebrities. So, if we introduce face recognition technology in Hong Kong, I think we need to make sure that we have um, measures locally to to uh, to deal with the problem. If after cosmetic surgeries they may look the same, then it will be difficult uh, to use the technology. Have you considered that? Well, let's see if the uh, clearance system in South Korea is is uh, particularly good. Under Secretary, let me first take his other questions. The concept of the face recognition technology is that first of all, this is the trend uh, according to the latest ICAO's requirement because around the world there is a trend to make it more convenient for passengers to cross the border. So face recognition technology is uh, the trend. At the same time, we must not compromise security and we adopt the technology only when uh, it is mature and reliable, and it is already used in other countries such as Australia, New Zealand, Europe, uh, Netherlands, uh, Netherlands, UK, etc. This technology is reliable. It is also acknowledged by the ICAO, International Civil Aviation Organization. So this will be the direction that we uh, will be heading in. And at the same time, we attach great importance to security. We need to make sure that uh, the technology will not bring about um, more risks, and that is why we're going to introduce the technology in phases. Now, uh, as mentioned in the paper, on arrival, visitors are required to go through clearance at counters. They cannot simply rely on face recognition technology. Apart from those who have enrolled before um, and have provided fingerprints with us. That is to say, for unenrolled passengers, we will only add another layer of security, which is the face recognition technology, and the and security therefore will not be affected. Well, as on arrival, we have already put in control of visitors. Then on departure, we would only make sure that the same visitor is departing from Hong Kong and that the, the visitor is not hiding somewhere in Hong Kong. And we have adopted this international standard, which can make sure that simply by relying on facial recognition technology, we can ensure the identity of the visitor as long as the e-travel document is also in line with the international requirements. Mr. Lang Chairman, 
Well, first of all, um, nine out of ten times when I use the e-channels, they don't work. It's either something wrong with the card, and it's not a one-off case. I was up there listening to the webcast, and I heard about people wasting so much time uh, on e-channels because, uh, um, uh, well, uh, maybe probably uh, only the f female passengers wouldn't swear, but otherwise everybody's where because the e channels don't work anyway nine out of ten times I'd say ten times because uh, on the only occasion I was told that since I was in a hurry I would be um, allowed to pass the e channel by uh, with the help of the officer so I want to lodge this formal complaint to you I think at the airport a lot of Visitors have the same experience. They just dare not speak out. So this is a formal complaint. There is something wrong with the e channels, and I think Mr. Lam Chuck Ting is right. Well, we have no idea. After passing on information to uh, the other side, how would the information be used? Maybe the information is about conviction record, uh, arrests made, but we have. People here with clear record. It's pointless to talk about e channels uh, speeding up the clearance procedure for Hong Kong residents because when I used to e channel, I couldn't, uh, it didn't work. So you need to take this seriously. Can we ban um, legislators from Macau from coming to Hong Kong? Of course not. How about detaining them for 30 minutes before they're allowed through? Um, maybe a buckle swap to confirm their identity? Of course not. This figurehead in Macau is shithead. He is shithead. Well, he uh, is using warheads. Like missiles, um, Mr. Lam Kwok Hong, no entry. Uh, Governor Granham, no entry. Well, a, sh a shithead is not a swear word. Well, let's don't digress, Mr. Lam Kwok Hong. I need to uh, attend. I needed to attend a wedding banquet. I even showed him the invitation, and then they said no. It has nothing to do with us. Uh, what about grave sweeping or um, New Year gathering? I similarly was rejected. This is not tolerable. Well, uh, in English, our title is uh, the Honorable Member, which means uh, we have integrity. Not to say that we deserve respect, but um, we did not have any. We did, we were uh, we were not respected there, and even if we needed to answer the nature's call, we needed to ask for permission first. And it didn't just happen to me; it happened to journalists as well. Somebody, there was somebody called Lang Kwok Hong. Well, we have several hundred Lang Kwok Hongs in Hong Kong, and uh, then Lang Kwok Hong, Ray Chan, Nathan Law, they all just sat there. We have several thousand uh, similar cases. Uh, can we disallow uh, Choi Sang On from coming to Hong Kong? Well, no, because uh, he's a shithead, the figurehead. I think that those barring entry into the territory must be called uh, shithead. I think that this is Ms. Mr. Lang Kwok Hong's comment, and let's see if the Under Secretary would like to respond. The, well, Mr. Lang Kwok Hong, your time is up. Now, Mr. Lang Kwok Hong said that uh, his ID card didn't work when using the e channel. Then I suggest that you replace your ID card. Uh, maybe it's because of the way you, so, you 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 store your ID card. There is something wrong with the chip in your ID card. Well, Mr. Lang Kwok Hong, your time is up, please. This is the time for Under Secretary to respond to your comment. I still have other members to uh, call. All right, your time is up, Under Secretary. According to our usage record and uh, utilization rate, uh, we're very happy with the successful rate of e-channels. Well, I just received a motion 
moved by Mr. Lam Chuck Ting. I have uh, put it on the projector. My ruling is that this motion is not directly related to the paper that we're discussing, although in Mr. Lam Chuck Ting's motion, he does mention the new immigration control system. He at the same time also talks about prerequisites that involves um, immigration policy. Mm -hmm. According to paragraph 3.45A of the Chairman's Handbook, I don't think this is relevant to the issue in question, so I am not going to um, approve this motion. Well, Chairman, 3.45A, can you read it out? Well, this is about the uh, Chairman's Handbook for the Panel, paragraph 3.45. If a member moves moves without notice in relation to any agenda item, the Chairman should deal with uh, the uh, motion in accordance with the following procedure. First, to decide whether the motion is directly relevant to the item in question. I don't think it's relevant, so I'm not going to approve it. And Mr. Lam Chuck Ting just now submitted another motion. Well, may, may I comment on your ruling? No. No, I don't think your ruling is reasonable because it is relevant. It is, of course, directly relevant. I said if you do not um, rectify the situation, we're not going to support you. I need to state my reason why we must restrict the entry of Ming, uh, Macau officials to Hong Kong. I don't want to um, start an argument. I maintain my ruling. I've already given my explanation. It's, of course, relevant. I need to deal with your second motion now. Uh, Chairman, well, for the first motion, I think it's unreasonable. I've made a ruling on the first motion. The Chairman's ruling should be, but you are not omnipotent. If if your ruling is unreasonable, then it's unreasonable. I want to show other members your second motion. Well, Gary Chan, this is outrageous. Mr. Lam Kuo Hong, if you want to speak, please. Take a seat and speak only w with the permission of Chairman. This is the second motion moved by Mr. Lam Chuck Ting, and I think that it is not directly re relevant to the item in question because it is related to, rather to the immigration policy. I'm not going to approve the second motion. Now, I have dealt with your motions according to the handbook for chairmen of panels. You may not agree with my ruling, but my ruling should be final. You can follow up on the issues uh, on other occasions. And if there are no other comments, I will wrap up this item, and we can now move on to the to item five. Mr. Lam Chuck Ting, we have completed this item. For other members who have raised your hands, is it a point of order, or would you like to speak in relation to the next item? Next item, all right. Item five. It's uh, body worn cameras for the police. Okay. For this item, we have the Under Secretary for Security, Mr. Andrew Zhang Yutong, Principal Assistant Secretary for Security, Mr. Dennis Cheng, Assistant Secretary for Security, Mr. Patrick Takas Jura, Hoxson, Assistant Commissioner of Police, Mr. Dennis Cheng Wai Kin, Superintendent, and Mr. Patrick Lin, Senior Inspector. I'll ask the Under Secretary to uh, introduce the subject, and then we can follow this by a Q and A session. We have reported uh, to the panel on uh, the use of uh, body one video cameras by the police. There were two rounds of uh, trial scheme trials to assess the effectiveness of uh, body one uh, video cameras. According to the field trial, 
the recorded uh, message would uh, accurately record uh, record what had occurred. So uh, the information is uh, useful in terms of evidence and evidential value, and also uh, is uh, useful for the sentencing. And some people would uh, stop the resorting to the excessive uh, behavior when they see that a uh, video camera is in operation. Some in ninety percent of the, those uh, incidents, once the uh, body one uh, video cameras uh, was switched on, uh, the relevant uh, people would uh, stop using the offensive uh, language or the violent behavior. So it's important. It's useful in uh, calming people, and the. Um, screen is facing ours so that those who are ca uh, being videoed would know that uh, the uh, camera is in operation and uh, the uh, vid video footage will be uh, destroyed un unless uh, it's needed for evidence and uh, Footage carrying the no evidential value will be deleted after 31 days from the date it was produced, and uh, the footage is going to be hand um, processed and managed by another team of officers, and everything that is done will be documented. And there is also a special uh, electronic signature and electronic. Uh, Authentication to ensure the proper tracing. Uh, the police is going to the procure more video cameras for their officers. In the long run, the police would like to make one available for every frontline officer, and this uh, scheme will be implemented in phases. In 2021, with the fourth uh, generation uh, communication system, uh, every frontline officer will be uh, equipped with a uh, body-worn video camera. The police uh, would uh, work has uh, worked very uh, diligently to prevent loss of uh, footage or personal information. And uh, this is beneficial both to the uh, police officer concerned and uh, those being video videotaped. As I've said, ninety percent of the on ninety percent of the occasions, once the video camera is switched on, uh, those con those people uh, would uh, would uh, stop uh, violent uh, behavior or the or using offensive language. A number of members have liked to uh, ask questions, including Mr. Michael Tin and others, nine other members. Mr. Tin, Under Secretary, in the special finance committee meeting, I said that you should give every off police officer a video camera. A body worn video camera is a super. Conciliator, according to a Cambridge study, it uh, complaints against police officers dropped by ninety percent once uh, uh, the officers are equipped with this. And in a U.S. study, the drop was eighty percent. And in Ho Hong Kong, we have done some uh, few trials. Uh, once uh, a, per a citizen uh, knows that, that there is a video that capturing their their behavior, they would uh, tend to behave. So. I believe once you give uh, every police officer a, a video camera, there will be a, a drastic reduction in conflict. Uh, uh, Mr. Undersecretary, I said 
I uh, had an open mind about whether we should have a law to prevent insults to police. But uh, I believe uh, with the uh, body worn video cameras introduced to the police force, there would be fewer conflicts, and perhaps uh, there's no need to explore further whether there's a need uh, to prevent insult to police. Can we uh, learn from overseas experience? Are there countries considering the, such a law, and then uh, this, they, this, they have decided not to uh, because of the um, there's the, no longer the urgency as once they have introduced body worn video cameras. Because once you want to introduce a law on insult to police, uh, then people would say, is there going to be another law to, uh, to prevent insult to the to our citizens? So can we have some information about overseas experience under secretary? Under secretary. Uh and in in some jurisdictions they have uh laws to prevent the uh, use of uh, offensive language against uh, law enforcement officers. But of course, every jurisdiction has to consider its own uh, circumstances before the consideration is given to such legislation. If there's mutual respect in the community, and of course, if uh, with the introduction of uh, BWECs uh, leading to fewer conflicts, uh, should uh, that would be a uh, that that would be that would be a positive factor uh, in uh, the consideration. Ninety percent, uh, as I've said, ninety percent of the occasions uh, would uh, in the, when the video camera is switched on, uh, the people would uh, calm down. And if they don't, and uh, they resort to violence, and they committed other offenses such as assault, uh, then you'll be captured. Well, if it's so good, can we do it earlier than 2021? They have about 1,390 uh, sets. They are going to procure more uh, in phases. So we need to get uh, officers uh, trained to use them. Uh, we have uh, tactical units, to use well, I I I have just a simple question. Can can the uh, completion date be uh, advanced? We're going to buy more. That's definite. And we want to tie in with the fourth generation of uh, com police communication system. We don't want to give more and more gears to our officers. So this will be integrated into the fourth uh, generation system. So uh, in the short term, they are going to buy a few more, a few hundred more, and uh, they will be given to different police uh, formations, and then uh, the coverage will be expand extended. We all also want to give police officers a time to get uh, accustomed to. This new equipment, so by twenty twenty one the whole system should be ready. Uh, we want to move at a, a steady pace and so that uh, everyone, including the general public, would be uh accustomed to this. I'm sh shocked at the very slow progress of giving every officer a body worn video cameras. There are 1,390 uh, cameras in the force. They started to use this in 2006, and, also, and now we're told that uh, we'll be able to give every officer a camera in 2021. So it's a 15 year program. So and uh, from 2006 uh, 
to this day, the, it's uh, a span of uh, 11 years. And uh, what has uh, technology to progress? When the, the police started to consider Star Trek uh, was one of the uh, advanced uh, models, it's now obsolete. When did we have the first generation of iPhone? My phone t tells me that uh, this year is the 10th anniversary of the launching of iPhone. It was the first uh, iPhones uh, were marketed in 2007. So uh, nowadays, if you say everyone should be equipped with a mobile phone, it's, n it's already a, an outdated concept. So, Under Secretary, do we, do you agree that this is too low a process, too slow a process, and you are going to purchase a few more hun a few hundred, more hundred, a few hundred cameras for officers? What's the ratio? Uh, of uh, camera to officers, Don't, would you agree that it's still very low? And is it that uh, we can only to ultimately achieve uh, this uh, aim of giving every officer a BWEC in 2021? Is there no way of uh, expediting the process? Uh, I would. Uh, Offer the response first before I invite the police uh, to tell you about the uh, details of implementing this uh, program. Well, we started to use uh, handheld video recording devices uh, in 2006, but that's a different uh, device. It's a video cam camera. It's not a body-worn video camera, and uh, it's for a different purpose. The video, the handheld, the uh, video recording uh, devices are used for some purposes. For example, uh, uh, for criminal investigation, uh, to for video recording uh, at the scene, or to the, take the uh, suspect back to the scene for the evidence gathering. The body worn video cameras uh, will be. For the purpose of handling uh, conflicts or uh, incidents that would uh, affect public order, uh, we have to consider privacy uh, in this particular case. Uh, we did consult uh, the privacy commissioner, and according to the commis privacy commissioner. Uh, the use of body-worn video cameras is in line with the uh, privacy legislation. Well, Under Secretary, it doesn't mean that we should not uh, move ahead with uh, te technology advancement. Would you admit that we are doing it too slowly? Well, we need to use the footage as uh, evidence in court. We have to ensure that the so-called chain of uh, evidence is unbroken in the process. So there are strict requirements involved. I will ask uh, Mr. Hoxson to re further elaborate. Uh, just um, first of all, if I could point out that at the present we have 1,388 cameras. We are proposing to secure before June this year an additional 270 cameras. Um, two, 270 cameras. If I can specifically address the uh, point of uh, the distribution scale, I think it's important to note that, uh, it's that it's not the ratio, it's the issue of access that our officers have. So essentially our operational needs will dictate the pace of purchase. We need to be uh, cognizant of the fact that uh, all of our mobile patrol vehicles and our emergency unit vehicles have mobile have video cam uh, body worn cameras available on them, so our officers can respond to give support to our officers in major public order events. Uh, our police tactical unit and our uh, officers deployed to duties there are also issued with those cameras so it 's based on risk assessment and based on uh, the ability of our officers to operationally respond as necessary. Also, our regional command and control centres are aware of officers who have body-worn cameras and based on the nature of the incident can task officers with body-worn cameras to respond. 
Uh, in terms of the incremental purchase program, uh, we have to also be uh, alive to the fact that these cameras are changing in a rapidly uh, a rapid environment. And the refresh scale of the technology is, is relatively quick, um, and we need to also be reassured that we have business continuity as these cameras uh, are replaced and changed. So a bulk purchase in one go uh, would, would compromise, could potentially jeopardize that business continuity program. So at this point, the pace is appropriate for our operational needs. I don't think uh, members are so happy with the progress. But anyway, Mr. Elvin Young, I want to refer to paragraph 7 of the paper. Uh, it is said that when the relevant footage is obtained, it will be passed to another team of officers for, officers for processing or storage. And in the same paragraph, it is also said that if the footage doesn't have any investigative or evidential value, it will be deleted after 31 days. Now, which team of the police is responsible for that? Uh, is it the team of officers for the case or another team of officers to decide whether the footages have no investigative or evidential value? Under Secretary, if a footage is related to a case, but of course, and of course, the case will be dealt with by the CID or the criminal investigation team, and they will decide whether it has uh, the uh, evidential value, and it will be up to them to decide whether the footage carries any fact. So this will be decided by the investigation team. If the footage is not related to any case, let's say after switching on the camera, the member of the public has already calmed down and that no prosecution will be initiated. The footage may not be passed to the criminal investigation team and then the superior of the officer concerned will check the footage to see if it's in line with the um, statement and if it is found to be not related to any case, it will be passed on to, to uh, a team of uh, controlling uh, officers and then after 31 days, they will be destroyed, Mr. Young, because in a criminal trial, the defense may sometimes ask for unused material. That is, prosecution has not relied on these unused documents or materials. It may be valuable to the defense. When the police decides whether certain footages are useful, then ultimately in the court proceedings, these footages may be useful for the defense as unused materials to be disclosed. So I want to know under such circumstances, how can you prevent the police from deleting these materials or footages that may be useful for the defense? Under Secretary. Mr. Yuan's question is right. All information or papers um, related to the case will be stored by the uh, officers as unused materials and will have to be disclosed to the uh, to the other party. There is clear guideline in the law that it, as far as the enforcement. Uh, agency is concerned, even if um, it is not used in the prosecution process, it should be listed as unused materials for disclosure to the defense. My concern is that for the footages deleted, they could have been um, unused materials. So when will it be decided that the footage should be deleted or should be listed as unused materials? How do you draw the line on the secretary? But different investigation units may have different um, investigation work. And in terms of criminal investigation, any material used, but well, even when decided by the officer in charge as not related, should be retained. So as mentioned by Mr. Young, when the footage is passed 
onto the investigating officer. And even if the investigating officer decides that it is not related to the case, it should still be kept. Now, I understand Under Secretary's point. The officer may have um, viewed the footage and decided to keep it, and there are footages that will be destroyed for the sake of uh, being irrelevant to the case. My concern is for the footages to be destroyed, they may still be used ultimately by the defense as in used material. How can we uh, make sure? And the secretary, let me elaborate on it. If within 31 days, of retaining the footage, there is no investigation at all, then there is no question of whether the footage is used or unused. If within 31 days um, the uh, footage was used in the investigation process, then it should be um, kept. Now, let's see if I get your point. Now, some footages may not be used at all, and in the end of the 31-day period, it will, they will be destroyed. Now, for some footages, some of them may be used in a criminal trial, and for some other footages unused, they may be used, they may be listed as unused materials in a criminal trial. Is that correct? In the investigation process, as Disclosure of unused materials is required. The investigating officer is required to keep them. I'm sorry you have taken up quite a lot of time. Next, Mr. Ronick Chen. Thank you, Chairman. I have a number of questions. Now, about the latest uh, model of the BWVCs, what is the cost and what about the um, maintenance cost? Would that con um, attribute to the fact that uh, the progress is slow, and also on a number of frontline offices. Ms. Darily just now mentioned the ratio of uh, BV, BWVCs to frontline offices, so I'd like to have both figures, please. And about uh, the uh, cameras, according to the paper, professional training is required to operate the cam camera, and we have 11,000 police officers who have undergone training. And um, that is why I'd like to know the number of frontline officers. If we have more frontline officers, does it mean that you need to step up training for them as well on the use of BWVCs? Next, if the cameras are proven to be so effective, then will the government consider using such cameras on um, frontline officers such as FEHD inspectors, uh, uh, tobacco control office officers, etc., who m uh, may have uh, conflicts with the public. Now, on the use of PWVCs, we have not taken into account. I mean, we have not considered the facts. Uh, the the uh, cost, operational needs, is our major. Uh, consideration. I'll see if we have any ratio in relation to frontline officers. I mean, the term frontline officers uh, is just a concept. Even the PCRO is a frontline officer, but they will not be equipped with the BWVCs. We're talking about actual operational needs. That is, whether frontline officers will be um, prone to uh, clashes uh, or whether the, the officers may be dealing with cases of breach of peace. So usually it's about um, we have um, the emergency units and maybe in the future even patrol subunits. As to the um, how much the scheme will be extended, we will review the progress first because our major consideration is whether the officer is required to deal with any case of breach of peace or um, or confrontational scenarios. Second point, we have 10,000 officers who have undergone training, and we need to step up training as well, because for the 10,000 officers who have under, undergone training, they may be deployed to other posts, and we also need to train new recruits on the use of cameras. And if we uh, introduce new measures, we also need to provide training. For the 10,000 officers, we believe that uh, the number of officers trained will continue to increase. Uh, Mr. Chen also asked whether the cameras will be used by other departments apart from the police, and that will be up to the uh, head of departments. Uh, I understand that the Correctional Services Department also uses 
BWVCs to deal with confrontations. Including the um, places of visits, and because there may be uh, there may be disputes over cha um, over the uh, visits or the visiting hours, and also some um, uh, confront other confrontational scenarios. So it's up to the other departments to decide whether to use the cameras or not, and uh, we'll be happy to share our experience with them if necessary. Assistant Director, can you tell us uh, something about uh, the uh, ratio of uh, frontline officers and BP, uh, BWVCs, Commissioner? So we have, as I say, we have uh, uh, 1,380 cameras uh, distributed across the uh, uh, formations uh, who have access to it, which is the uh, police tactical unit, emergency unit, and our uh, patrol subunits, including mobile patrol cars. We also have um, extended this to uh, enforcement and control officers in traffic units. Um, every subunit will have access to cameras, and every police tactical unit will be issued with cameras. The specific day-to-day uh, -day ratio uh, I don't have that figure, but suffice to say, every officer will have access either by being issued a camera or being able to call one uh, at very short notice. Okay, now. Uh, Chairman. And also about the uh, video facility that, you know, currently used. Uh, at the moment, we have, uh, it, it is an incremental uh, purchase acquisition. We have two models of camera. Uh, the first model was uh, uh, considerably uh, more expensive, and as the technology grows, the price has been reduced. So our present cameras that we're purchasing are in the region of about $3,000 per camera. Okay. okay. Uh, Mr. Ray Chan. Thank you. Chairman, just now, according to the administration, uh, cost is not their major consideration for using BWVCs, and some members suggested that uh, there should be one camera per officer, but that is not the case, and that is why the police has introduced a two-phase scheme, and according to the paper, it is said that the uh, result of the pilot is satisfactory, and that's why they've decided to buy more cameras. I'd like to know the... Um, criteria of the review. For example, like Under Secretary mentioned, over ninety percent in over ninety percent of the cases the, uh, the 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 members of the public tend to become calmer and that may be one criterion. Is there any unhappy experience uh, or side effect uh, that you can share with us? Another point I wish to ask is this the difference between a handheld camera in the past and uh, BWVCs is this. The, for handheld cameras, they may be more objective because a third party will be uh, taking the um, video. And for BWVCs, well, it's a direct shooting from the police officer to the members of the public. And the member of the public asks whether it is against the law for the uh, member of the public to use a mobile phone to um, take a video of the police officer, because I watched a clip before. The police officer asked the member of the public not to, um, not to take the video. Under Secretary. Thank you. Mr. Chen, well, what did we test in the trial runs? Well, we test the, the camera. We have one here. This is to ensure fairness. The one being uh, videoed will be a video tape would know that there's a red light flashing and also the camera is facing outwards. So you know what uh, is being captured by the camera and also it also records a sound, not just your sound, but also my sound if it's on. We don't have a 360 degree the camera. Uh, we'll test if that's one. Uh, but uh, uh, Miss Mo. In other police forces, they're using similar devices like this one. Well, we don't have uh, 
that kind of uh, wide angle or all angled uh, video camera. I think fa fairness is most important in the use of uh, BWVCs. As I've said, uh, those uh, being videotaped, 80% uh, of them will come down. And in a court case, the the judge will consider the evidence, and there's there's been there have been convictions, and there have been acquittals uh, based on the uh, evidence on the uh, footage. And so it's a question of fairness. So. Uh, if the person has come down the after the video camera is switched on and uh, the that person might have done something uh, illegal before the camera is on and still the the court would uh, may decide that there's no evidence and another member has asked questions on uh, unused materials and we have had an obligation to disclose those to the defense and uh, we have also got to the consider privacy protection, and that is uh, when the intended use is no longer there, uh, the footage has to be deleted in 31 days. So this is to ensure fairness and to let let the court. Uh, what ab what about guidelines about uh, videotaping of police action? Do you have a guideline that uh, it should be stopped? I don't see there's any law that a purely videotaping police work is uh, not okay. But if there, there's anything that would uh, hinder the discharge of police duty, then uh, there's uh, uh, there's there's a law on this. And of course, at the end of the day, it's for the court. To rule on uh, these things, Mr. Lo Kun Chong, well, you you have t t set out in the paper that uh, international experience uh, is positive, but I will also say it's controversial as well. Uh, the uh, camera would uh, facilitate law enforcement by the police. Uh, it may calm down people, uh, not just uh, people involved in public order events, but also police officers, because uh, it can uh, prevent, for example, the abuse of power by police officers. So I hope uh, you should introduce some uh, management measures in conjunction with uh, BWVCs, so as to safeguard the benefit of uh, the public. For example, in that. Uh, a sort case involving the seven officers. If they have a camera on them, uh, then uh, they would not do. They would would not have done what they did uh, if they know, if they knew the camera is on. So I hope uh, they should uh, have some the guidelines, and you should let the know the public know that um, there are guidelines. Uh, in regulating the use of such a BWVCs, so as to uh, assure the public that um, the police uh, would be uh, reasonable and impartial in the discharge of duties. In uh, the UK and in some states of the US, they would uh, their police forces would upload their uh, guidelines on the use of BWVCs uh, to a website, to their websites. In paragraph six. You state that uh, once uh, the purpose is served, the police officer should uh, stop the video recording. What do you mean by by this? Are you going to be selective in uh, video taping? For example, in the U.S. Uh, uh, there was a case where a driver was shot by a police officer, but the camera was never on. And in paragraph seven, uh, the uh, footage can only be checked by the supervisor. Uh, there was a case in the UK on this point. 
and that is uh, the police officers could uh, view the footage before court attendance, so they can uh, try to uh, check with one another uh, what what to testify and how to testi testify. So the the question is uh, availability to the public. According to the privacy law, it's very difficult. It's a forty-day rule, uh, which is very different from the what they had in what they have in uh, Las Vegas, which is you know, the footage must be made available in five days. Well, under secretary, uh, let me respond to the uh, points. Uh, there are many points made by Mr. Law. If the party concerned wants to view the footage, what can be done? Well, according to the uh, PDPO and the uh, access, the code on uh, access to information, there are procedures to follow. The person can uh, submit an application, and according to the code to, on uh, access to information and the PDPO, uh, the application will be processed, and the footage may be made available. And how to make Sure that there's no abuse of the foot of the material uh, and footage. There are a few things here. When the patrolling officer videotapes something, uh, he has to make a report after returning to the duty. Uh, returning to the station, and uh, even uh, the uh, officer taking back the. Uh, BWC would uh, know would check whether there's been any recording made, and uh, the, on this uh, device you can only view the footage. You can check whether uh, there's been uh, any videotaping activity. There's no function on the device to delete the footage. The De deletion can only be done by another team. So they have to view the footage to see if it's relevant to any case. If there's a investigation, then the investigation team will have to view the footage. So the uh, officer doing the videotaping will have no access to it anymore, and there is a security uh, seal. You cannot remove the memory card, and also there's a electronic signature. In the memory card, so uh, it, you can trace whether it has been tampered with. So there are a lot of security features incorporated in this uh, system, and uh, the signature e, e signature for each team is different. So we have all these um, safeguards to prevent uh, tampering uh, with the media. I've I've been uh, rather. To, Generous in time management because I know members are, are, are very keen to talk about this subject. So uh, we have still nine uh, members who would like to ask questions. So first, I would like to extend the meeting time to 1 p.m., which we can all f further extend if necessary. Agreed? Okay. Uh, Miss Cordia Mo. Well, you compare the uh, uh, a mobile phone uh, of any uh, person with the uh, this uh, BWVC is not uh, really appropriate. No, it's a body worn camera and a lot like a mobile phone where you have to uh, operate uh, with a lot of. Uh, Maneuvers and uh, control tabs, uh, but uh, well, ordinary people would not know the, what's has been the videotape and what has been deleted. If a year down the road uh, I'm brought to the court for some offence, uh, I would not know that the police uh, had or had not uh, deleted any footage. It said that the officer should stop. Uh, the videotaping once the purpose is served. Of course, uh, you you would say that is uh, based on professional judgment on the spot. And if I very calmly videotaping the uh, the police 
officer uh, doing something, there's, there's no law against it. That's what uh, the media do. What the rep what uh, what the, the what reporters do. Uh, just like what um, Mr. Charles Moore is trying to do. But uh, the officer may say that uh, you should not videotape me. You are standing in the way of my discharge of duty. So it's not an equal uh, treatment arrangement. Many people would uh, be scared and uh, they they don't want to be uh, guilty of uh, obstruction of police duty and they would uh, stop. And also the, the f if after more than a year I'm charged with certain offense and I quickly remember that uh, some officer uh, videotaped me but the police might say no, no we didn't or the footage uh, have been uh, deleted. And uh, the Under Secretary says uh, the uh, the CID would uh, uh, decide whether there's any uh, value in keeping the footage and also to, uh, uh, there's another officer to decide whether the footage should be deleted. Has there been any case where the footage is deleted uh, inadvertently? Uh, no. But there has never been any case uh, of uh, footage being handled in violation of the uh, internal procedures and arrangements. But the accused would never know whether you 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 took and you have taken any uh, footage or deleted anyone, any any footage. Well, that's why we want to keep it for 31 days under the uh, privacy law. When you collect personal data. Or after you have collected personal data, if the purpose of collection is no longer there, you, you should uh, s stop at that moment. You ask the question when the camera should be switched on. If the video uh, video taping is for the purpose of collecting evidence, and if uh, the incident already comes to an end, there's no need to continue to the collect. Personal data, for example, people chatting. So it's, un it's in accordance with the law that the uh, purpose of the collection is no longer there. You should once you stop, and the person being videotaped can uh, ask for information, uh, or he can lodge a complaint that uh, the uh, video camera was used improperly. And of course, uh, if there's a complaint to the capo. Uh, then the footage will have to be kept uh, f for the purpose of uh, complaint investigation, and if uh, the request is made within 31 days, then we have to act in accordance with the uh, privacy law and the act code on access to information. So there will be no question of uh, deleting uh, the uh, footage. Intentionally, so as to prevent access by the person concerned. Well, we have already uh, consulted the PVC commissioner, and we we believe our arrangements can facilitate investigation as well. Uh, Mr. Nathan Law has moved a motion, which I have approved, and the secretariat will distribute the co uh, motion to members now. Dr. Kenneth Lau, I'd like to pick up on the last question about the uh, guidelines on the use of VWVCs. Is it open to the public? And that's the first question. If it's not um, open then to the public, then why? Under Secretary, when we conduct a few trials of the VWVCs, we already uploaded to the internet details of the trials, explaining to the public how the BWVCs work, for example. And uh, after the meeting, if you wish, Ms. Claudia Moore can show you. What the BWVC is, how is the video recording done, and the purpose of conducting the trials. 
and on the actual operation of BWVCs, we've also released information online for the public's reference. So, in other words, you do not have a set of guidelines. Uh, before issuing the guidelines, however, have you shown it to the uh, Privacy Commissioner? Dr. Lang's question, about Dr. Lang's question, we, when we previously reported to the panel members, we already explained that we did. And according to the Privacy Commissioner, a letter was issued to the security panel, uh, which was also um, carbon copy to us, uh, showing that uh, the Privacy Commissioner already read our guidelines and that the BWVCs are in line with the privacy law. And in case of non compliance, the uh, PDPO will um, take action. So, have you shown the guidelines to members of the IPCC? Because the members of IPCC also uh, deals, deal with a lot of uh, cases of police complaints. Under Secretary, oh, I was stand to be corrected, but it seems that we first introduced the BWVCs in 2013, and we already um, gave an account to the uh, IPCC. If you wish, Dr. Long, I could give you the details later after the meeting. But the guidelines are not transparent, and you have not disclosed the details. Let me ask you the following. Let's say um, I'm relying on the privacy law. If the police officer switches on the camera, will a warning be given to the public first? I understand that, yes, there is a red and indicated light. But will you require the police officer to first tell the member of the public before the camera is switched on? Yes, we do require the officer to tell the public, uh, except in very um, uh, in, in emergency situations. But I think that uh, for the majority of cases, according to our guidelines, the police officer is required to inform the public. Now, if a police officer loses the BWVC, then of course it is very important because it carries a lot of information. In your guidelines, are there any uh, sanction system under secretary? Any non-compliance with the guidelines will lead to investigation. Well, my question is, what if the camera is lost? Is it a reason for initiating any investigation? Well, if the officer indeed loses his camera, then of course there will be an investigation. Um, but I'll defer to the police to answer. Deputy Commissioner. Thank you. Um, if I could just perhaps uh, set it in context, the uh, safeguards that we have in place against uh, potential malpractice, as, as mm. was already pointed out, we have a very clear and stringent internal guidelines uh, which have been uh, perused by both the uh, Privacy Commissioner as well as the Department of Justice and their compliance are not inconsistent with, with any of the procedures for courts or uh, with the provisions in the Personal Data Privacy Ordinance. In terms of the uh, checks and balances we have in place, we have four separate levels. Mm. Um, the officer who receives the camera is issued it by an issuing officer. That issuing officer is responsible to check. The camera has three sets of serial numbers which all match. One is the camera housing itself, the SD card, and on top of the SD card, there is a one-use seal, which is a unique serial number, which is sealed across. So if the serial num that seal is removed, it is evident that it has been uh, it has been tampered with, and it is not available for use. Um, when an officer has used the BWVC, he must report it to his supervisor. The controlling officers have uh, no direct relationship and are independent of that team, who are informed upon, who are informed of those procedures. Beyond that, there is a oversight level of a chief inspector that will review the control and issuing processes surrounding the body-worn cameras. As uh, the Under Secretary pointed out, the body-worn cameras, the, uh, the SD card is, um, is encrypted, so it cannot be altered, edited, or deleted, and must go through a digital uh, um, system 
uh, which okay. contains an audit trail of who has used that camera. Um, the use of the body-worn camera itself um, is overtly worn. The officer will give a warning and the camera, um, if I could just demonstrate, sir, if I turn the camera on, it is not recording. It is in standby. You can see the red light is on, but it is not recording. It is on standby mode. Only when it is deployed to record will it sound an alarm and it will also flash a red light. And then the officer will say, I am recording you. So the uh, procedures are very clear in terms of ensuring that the subject is fully informed that the camera is deployed and recording. Uh, Mr. Charles Mock. Chairman, I think that uh, we're discussing the use of BWVCs by the police, and we understand that uh, we would like to be fair to both parties. And in our discussion, I think that the police, as well as the Security Bureau, already mentioned that in case of confrontational scenarios, the cameras help members of the public simmer down up to 80%. And in other countries, we've learned from the news about a lot of cases uh, that only that doesn't only apply to members of the public, but also to the police. But since the cameras will be worn by the police officers, it will be up to the police officers to decide when to switch on the cameras and what will be captured. I want to know if there are cases in which police officers have come down after the cameras are, are switched on uh, and whether the recordings are available. Of course, you may not release them in the public domain. And uh, also, if the police officer doesn't switch it on, then the uh, member of the public won't be able to switch on the police's camera himself. So I think that uh, you need to convince the public that the cameras will bring benefit to both the the police as well as the public. Do you have any such examples? After using BWVCs, originally, say, some police officers may uh, get a bit emotional in his words or in his deeds, and uh, it so happened that uh, the the action was caught on camera and then the case was handled by you. Well, I, I, I believe that you won't see a lot of cases like this because if the police officer gets uh, really uh, agitated, he may not switch on his own camera. But still, if there is any such case available, I think you can cite the case so as to convince the public that it brings mutual benefits. Under Secretary. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Charles Mock, I understand your point as to whether we have ac any actual example. I think I uh, uh, defer to uh, to uh, Assistant Commissioner to uh, answer your question. Uh, but I understand that even if um, the uh, case is uh, not uh, is detrimental to the prosecution, the clip was used in the court proceeding. Say after an incident happened, the court uh, viewed the videotape and found that it didn't help the prosecution. We still submitted it as evidence, and uh, in the end, there was uh, not a case to answer for the case, and uh, and we believe that impartiality and fairness are the most important elements. According to uh, what you mentioned, for the experience in the United States. I think the major consideration for using BWVCs is to make sure that the act of the police officer will also be caught on tape. And a U.S. judge even ruled that BWVCs should be used in uh, the in the state. Um, by all officers to ensure fairness. And because of 
modern tech. Well, because the technology at the moment only allows the camera to face one direction, whereas you can capture sound in all directions. Well, members, uh, um, I need to discuss with you housekeeping matters. I've just extended the meeting to one o'clock, and um, to facilitate the discussion of this item and the other item, I suggest that we extend the meeting by another fifteen minutes to. F- Ten, um, um, one fifteen, because I have uh, seven members on the list and also a motion that we need to deal with. Well, we still have another item uh, relating to construction of the quarters for Fire Services Department in Park Shekok. I want to ask the Secretary whether it, this is an urgent item, because I understand that you need to submit the item to the uh, PWSC and the Finance Committee soon. Can you just take my question first? Uh, yes, uh, it is uh, quite urgent. So um, about the construction of uh, FSD's Discipline Services Quarters, I don't think it's controversial. So if members agree, I'd like to complete all agenda items today before we adjourn the meeting. Any objection? No? Mr. Lang Kuo If there are questions, how many extensions can you have? By another 15 minutes and then 15 minutes? Well, Mr. Lang, for those who would like to ask questions, they have indicated their wish to ask questions. But you don't know about the quarters, right? Well, but if you want to ask questions, I won't draw a line. I won't stop you from asking questions. So let's move on. Uh, coming back to this item, uh, Mr. Wilson Orr. Thank you, Chairman. I think members may recall that starting from 2006, the police began to use the handheld camera system. And with advances in technology, we're talking about body worn video cameras today. And I think that the Bureau and the police should introduce the cameras as soon as possible because it can enhance transparency and accountability. In the paper, I read that all footages will be retained for at least 31 days. Under Secretary, I want to know how you come by 31 days, and from your experience in handling certain cases, will the period be too short, and will it affect the um, investigation on the problem of storage? Under Secretary, uh, I think we've struck a balance by suggesting 31 days, because from gathering evidence to prosecution, we need to consider the time frame. And in the Personal Data Privacy Ordinance, it is clearly stipulated that if the purpose of collecting the personal data no longer exists, then we should destroy the data. Uh, we should not retain the data. And that is why we have set the period to be 31 days. And we have also um, consulted the uh, Privacy Commissioner, which, who opined that uh, we are in compliance with the privacy law. For the 31-day period, it ensures that both parties can make their request. For example, if somebody wishes to make a complaint, then he will have sufficient time to do so. When the police complaint unit is required to handle the case, the footage will become um, one of the materials to be uh, looked at, and it will be retained. For the for criminal investigation, the same applies because once the investigation commences, the material will be invest uh, looked into, and it will not be deleted. So it will be kept for at least 31 days, and if the subject then requests for the footage to be provided according to the code of access to information or the personal data privacy ordinance that will have sufficient time frame to deal with it. I think uh, this uh, 31 day period is too short. In the past, uh, did you encounter any uh, Cases whereby they, they they could not be handled properly, be improper, not can properly because of the short uh, period of 31 days. Did you have any previous cases? There are any cases where the 31 days has proved as a threshold. The uh, the guideline uh, the uh, police's uh, uh, 
trial was put on the police public page and was clearly stated that it was a 31-day threshold. That gives uh, time for both all parties to reflect on what was recorded and make a data access request. So we've not come across any instance where that 31-day threshold has passed. Notwithstanding that, sir, we also have a provision where a senior superintendent can personally, subject uh, to uh, conditions, extend that 31 days on a monthly basis. Um, but that, uh, in, in a complaint case, uh, once that's reported, the, uh, the complaints against police office will um, uh, have access to that uh, uh, recording and be able to uh, uh, conduct their investigations. Likewise, if it is an exhibit, it will be treated as, uh, in a court case, it will be treated as an exhibit and sealed in a tamper evident envelope. Mr. Leung Go Hong. Mr. Uh, Lo Kun Hong said that the, the report should be made uh, by the officer before the, the, the officer can view the footage because the officer is supposed to remember things instead of relying on the footage. But the, but the judge uh, once said that uh, it, the footage could be used to aid uh, his memory. I said, uh, well, it, it, it may not be the case. In every prosecution, because if you have viewed the footage, well, you would uh, not say anything contradictory to the uh, footage. Because if you once you have viewed the uh, footage, you know what's been captured and what's been not captured, and you can make up stories to 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 just uh, to align with the f uh, f footage captured. And the officer uh, would think that uh, he could uh, tell the, something that's untrue, one because it's not. In the footage, you have to make sure that the statement from the officer is made first before access is allowed. But well, you know that there was a case uh, uh, involving the, a collective viewing of uh, some the evidence. And, uh, and then there were a female officer asked him to pay attention to ten crucial uh, points about timing. I think Mr. Law Kun Chung has made an uh, important suggestion. You, you, it should take at least uh, a, a superintendent to be, to take care of this about whether the access is allowed and uh, the. the Unused material is not what you say. Let's say I want I've uh, arrested this person. I want to prosecute this one, and you need the evidence. Would the, the DOJ want to see all the materials concerned? Well, it's not evidence if you have uh, videotaped something which you do not use in the prosecution. I think we should uh, keep all raw materials, whether it's uh, termed unused material or not. Can you promise us that you will do this? If you have a prosecution, you have to keep everything. Not uh, only the material to furnish to the D of J and not used subsequently. Because now it's body worn. Uh, uh, you, you should give them time if you want answers, Mr. Leung. And there's a further question. Are you going to deploy another v camera with a an alternative angle when this is used, and also I would love, I'm all in favor of uh, making the uh, internal guidelines uh, 
accessible to all. But the PDPO and the code of access to information cannot handle th 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 this point. Mr. Leung uh, has referred to unused material. Uh, there are court judgments on this point. What are unused materials? The legal principles are clear. Even if the prosecution doesn't use such material for evidential purposes, if uh, it's in the hand of the prosecution, then uh, it should be made available. But it it can be deleted. It could have been deleted after 31 days. Well, the material. of the prosecution in the hand of the prosecution must be disclosed to the defense whether the material is used as evidence or not. As I've said, well if there's an investigation within the thirty one day period, then the footage is already taken for reference. So it's evidence. So the uh, guidelines that we have uh, implemented are fully in line with the law. Mr. Houghton Chow uh, I uh, agree with this proposal to issue BWVCs to police officers. We are not the first jurisdiction to do this. Uh, there is such uh, cameras are used uh, in various places and jurisdictions including the US aid and uh, there are people who uh, welcome this, and as a paper suggests, in in a, in a conflict, in a scenario of conflict, uh, the uh, use of uh, BWVCs can calm people down. Many pan Democrats today are very concerned about. Uh, the use of BWVCs, uh, which may capture footage, uh, which are detrimental to the accused or to the pro protesters, but I think uh, cameras are are candid, and uh, the footage may capture not just protesters, but also all other officers. So we should not uh, uh, have this. Uh, Biased uh, concept that uh, it's only going to benefit the police. I believe uh, the footage uh, is going to uh, ensure fairness to all, and people would uh, act with more the constraint if they see a camera in operation. So I welcome this proposal from the bureau. Any response from uh, you, Under Secretary? Thank you, Mr. Chow. Well, the body worn video cameras uh, work both ways. Uh, of course, uh, it's uh, effective uh, to in controlling the uh, behavior of uh, potential offend offenders and also the, the officers in question. Many police forces in the U.S. have adopted this. One of the purposes is to regulate police behavior. And uh, how should we strike the right balance? Well, we have the uh, operation guidelines, and we have put in suitable arrangements to ensure compliance with the law. Uh, in the U.S., a judge. Uh, Ask that a trial scheme be implemented in his jurisdiction, and in Chicago, they started to do this uh, in 2016. They have issued 6,000 cameras, and uh, New York has planned to issue 23,000 such cameras to their office for their officers, and the German is going to implement this in one of the uh, in some of the. Uh, Jurisdictions, including Bavaria, 
and uh, Australia, UK, uh, the, some of the police forces are doing this or have plans to, to do this. So it's not uh, introduced in Hong Kong to protect just one side. If the footage shows that someone is uh, committing a crime, I see no reason why the information should not be uh, made available in a court proceeding. So the, this would uh, ensure that uh, the court is uh, is uh, informed of the uh, full picture of an incident like that. Mr. Lau Kuo Fan, I mean, I I support the proposed uh, program of BWECs. You know that not, uh, cars are equipped with uh, cameras. In the past, when there's an accident, uh, the the drivers may argue who's to, who are to blame, and uh, they may have to ask the police to intervene. But now, with cameras on on board, uh, they may have a one point, uh, fronting. The vehicle another facing backwards, so the the BWVCs can help uh, different all sides to an incident. It can uh, prevent conflicts, and is there are safeguards for the public. Some young people have told me that. Uh, they may be asked to uh, present their IDs by police officers for a routine check. Uh, it's not a pleasant exp uh, experience to them. And if you have uh, BV BWVCs on the officers, uh, it's hel helpful. Do you have a timetable when uh, BWVCs will be available to all frontline officers? And how do you ensure that uh, people know that the video is uh, in operation? Oh, the the uh, BWVCs is to handle the situation of uh, situations of conflict or uh, or there's a, a public order event and, and the use is for the purpose of collection of evidence. As the assistant commissioner has uh, uh, informed. Members, uh, the camera is uh, pointing f forward, and there will be a flashing red light so that uh, people know that uh, the camera is in operation and the uh, audio uh, is uh, captured. And the footage cannot be deleted uh, by the officer. And they can only be viewed or, or the reviewed, and there are strict uh, procedures uh, to s to the followed. Uh, who can issue the, the the camera? Who can use the camera? And there are security seals, and the, the SD card cannot be removed uh, without approval. If the seal is broken, uh, we can tell that uh, uh, the camera has been tampered with, and we can collect evidence through the through the camera, and the evidence can be used in the court. Okay. Well, I understand that in terms of confrontations or public order events, the BWVCs will be used, but like I mentioned just now. When police officers are required to face the public, uh, very often I think that uh, the cameras sh should be put to wider use, because even on the internet you may see footages of members of the public arguing with uh, traffic police officers when they're um, issued with parking tickets, and if both parties can be safeguarded, then I think that um, the cameras can also be uh, put to greater use by all police officers uh, have to face the public. I think you've heard the Under Secretary, for example, 
for pe- uh, officers on patrol, if the cameras are switched on throughout the eight hours of patrol, then definitely um, a lot of evidence can be gathered. But we have struck a balance. We have been cautious in deciding that uh, the cameras will only be switched on in public order events and confrontational scenarios. Now, next is Mr. James Toe, and after Mr. James Toe, I will deal with Mr. Nathan Law's motion. I already add my views uh, on uh, pu- other occasions in public, but I'd like to say this to the administration. I've heard comments from other members, uh, some of the members, because uh, I was otherwise in the other room having another meeting just now. But anyway, first point, I think that if the camera is switched on, the you should not allow the police officers to switch it off, but rather you should keep it on until the police officer arrives at the police station. There may be a theory that you may be collecting more data than you need, but you must bear in mind that uh, when it comes to law enforcement, um, there is an exception. It should be kept on. And the third point, I don't think it sh- you should allow the police officer to decide that, uh, that it should be switched off and then switch on again when there is another confrontation. For achieving impartial and uh, um, for getting an impartial and fair footage, you may inevitably capture something else on video. But if we want to be objective and impartial, if the police officer is allowed to switch off the camera, then I think that this will undermine the overall objective. And I I even think that this this is inappropriate. Next point about retaining the footage for 31 days and that it can be used for training purposes. Well, I think um, it is questionable to capture the face of a member of the public for your training purpose. You may need to pay a fee. Well, let's say uh, not if you if you shoot videos not in the course of taking enforcement action. That's another matter. But if you are using the footage which shows squarely that person's face for training, I don't think it's appropriate. Next point, you mentioned the flashing indicator light and that the person would definitely know that the video, uh, the video camera is on. But in an actual confrontational scenario, you, the police officer may not have time to inform the subject. So my point is, once somebody is recorded on video, unless you cannot locate that subject, you should give a copy to that subject there and then. I make this point because because there may be somebody in the police officer's vicinity, and if that somebody is not given a copy in the nine months later, if you want to arrest that person, then the person concerned may not be able to find the uh, witnesses nearby to uh, look for the tape, and um, the arrestee can only rely on the video recording provided by the Department of Justice. So if video recording is so important, then a copy should be given as soon as possible. Now, the subject can make use of the footage to, say, lodge a complaint, to seek legal advice, and also to uh, locate witnesses. And this will be fair to the subject. One last comment. This camera is now only facing the front. And I think that the best way is to have a third party holding a camera like the press. Of course, it may not work unless you use a stick. But I understand that nowadays we have the technology with a camera in the shape of a ball that captures different directions. So perhaps apart from using the camera facing the front, you can also capture what happens on the sides. I don't think it, uh, you will go, you're going to use a lot of memory. Under secretary, now about the, th- the, uh, all angle cameras, as mentioned by Mr. James Toe, I already answered another member's question that if technology allows and we do keep an open mind 
and we're using the latest technology and equipment available and explain as explained by the assistant commissioner we are uh, inc um we are progressively making procurements because of uh, our consideration on the latest available products about mr james toast suggestion that the camera should be switched on all the way until the police officer returns to the police station if the law allows, then I think that we can give this a thought. But if you refer to the PDPO, the uh, Personal Data Privacy Ordinance, the purpose of data collection is s such that it should um, be sufficient for achieving that purpose, but not in excess. So in a scenario of a breach of peace, if the incident is over, and if Mr. James Toe suggests that the camera can remain to be switched on. Well, I think that uh, I can talk to the Privacy Commissioner about it. Uh, if the law allows, then, well, of course, we like to consult the Privacy Commissioner as well. And I can say that we have um, taken full, into full account uh, the law and the actual operation and interests of all parties before deciding on the 31 day retention period. As for the subject's right to get a copy under the PDPO and the Code of Access to Information, there are avenues available. And we're acting in accordance with the PDPO as well as the Code of Access to Information. He said he would consult the Privacy Commissioner first. Well, Chairman, I think that unless a third party is captured on the video, um, I think that it is dangerous not to provide a copy. I think from your answer, you're suggesting that uh, you don't want to give a copy. Now, I'm not suggesting that. I'm saying that we need to comply with the Code of Access to Information and the PDPO. Now, I am saying that it should not be provided on request. You should take the initiative to provide the subject with a copy. Uh, I said that we're acting in accordance with the law. That's the end of questions from members, and we need to deal with Mr. Nathan Law's motion moved without notice. And I need to refer to the handbook um, for chairman of panels. And would Madam Clark please project the motion onto the screen first? If you have this handbook in front of you, you can refer to paragraph 3.45 or perhaps 22P of the House Rules. For handling motions moved without notice, the chairman must decide whether the motion is directly relevant to the item in question, and I have ruled that it is directly relevant. And second point, if it is ruled to be directly relevant, then I should invite members attending the meeting to decide whether to deal with the motion. If we have a simple majority supporting the motion, then I mean supporting that the chairman should handle them, uh, deal with the motion, then we can proceed with it. So my first question is whether members agree to deal with Mr. Nathan Law's motion. With those in favor, please raise your hands. I'll read out the names Nathan Law, Ray Chen, Claudia Mo, Charles Mock, James Toe. Five members. With those um, who are against dealing with the motion, please raise your hands. Ten. Elizabeth Quad, Holden Chow, Stephen Ho, Yuxi Wing, Frankie Yik, Junius Ho, Wilson O, Ronick Chen, Starry Lee, and Horace Chung. So we have five votes in favor, ten votes against. So members are against uh, dealing with this motion. Yes? Point of order. I'm surprised. I've been in this uh, council for many years, for five years, and I do not have any recollection of dealing with the motion. It only happens to 37A. Um, I never noticed it before. Why all of a sudden we have this rule? Well, Ms. Claudia Mo, you also have this handbook of, for chairman of panels, and you can refer to the 3.45. Um, well, I'm acting in accordance with the handbook, 
Well, I have never experienced uh, something like this when I move a motion. I'm not trying to engage in a debate with you. I'm just expressing my curiosity. In, if you refer to the rules of procedure 22P, it also states a similar requirement. So I'm just following the um, house rules and also the uh, ROP. Item 6, uh, may I invite the uh, administration in? Item 6 is construction of discipline services quarters for the fire services department at Pacha Kwok Chang Kwan O. I'd like to remind members that in accordance with Rule 83A of the Rules of Procedure, if you have any direct or indirect pecuniary interest in relation to this item, then please disclose. Uh, please uh, declare your interest in advance. Miss Claudia Mo, we haven't adjourned the meeting yet. If you would like to talk to the government officials, please do that outside the room. La. We have Under Secretary Mr. John Lee, Principal Assistant Secretary Mr. Alex Chen, Assistant Director of Fire Services Department Mr. Andy Young, and we also have um, our government officials from the ASD and the Planning Department here. I will invite the Under Secretary to walk us through the paper first. The FSD is proposing to construct a the discipline services quarters for the FSD at Park Shek Kwok. The uh, MOD price is approximately $2,019.9 million. It's the government's policy to provide departmental quarters for married discipline services staff subject to availability of resources. In 2014, the government announced the uh, expedition of provision of DQs for RNF staff in order to provide 2,200 units by 2020. And this is one of the eight DQ projects, accounting for about 30% of uh, all the units to be provided. Altogether, we have 5,520. RNF staff of FSD eligible for DQs, but only. 3,792 units are available for allocation in about 30%, and the average waiting time at present is 6.2 years. In order to provide um, quality emergency service to the public, we need to have a professional FN, uh, fire services uh, department, and the FSD will continue to recruit our NF staff to uh, make up for the manpower shortfall and also to increase manpower for the new facilities. And we uh, can foresee an increasing demand for DQ units. And this project will provide 648 DQ units, and this will alleviate the, short, the uh, shortage of uh, DQ units. And I urge members to support this project. And with the panel's support, after consulting the Public Works Subcommittee, we will proceed with the funding approval from the Finance Committee. If funding approval is given within this legislative session, the construction works are expected to commence in the fourth quarter of this year for completion in late 2020. Mr. Chen Chichin wants to speak. Uh, does any other member who wish to speak? Uh, Ms. Elizabeth Kwok, Mr. Long Ko Hong, Mr. Houghton Chow. Four minutes for each member. Uh, I support uh, building more quarters for the FSD. Uh, recently, we have had some discussions about uh, the disparity between the pay and uh, terms of condition um, on employment uh, be of the police and those for FSD. On the whole, FSD uh, is. Uh, not getting as good conditions as the police. Well, it's going to cost two billion dollars. Uh, well, we have to wait until there's a PWSC paper before we can say whether the budget is too high or low. But uh, there will only be seven motorcycle uh, parking spaces and 101 uh, private car parking spaces. Why? There are so few. Perhaps you should explain to the PWSC. 
And in paragraph two, it says the gov is government policy to provide departmental quarters for married uh, discipline services staff subject to availability of resources. Under secretary, you know that's a judicial review uh, brought by a senior immigration officer against the uh, civil service bureau in that uh, his uh, husband uh, should be given uh, the the same uh, benefits like uh, heterosexual couples or heterosexual spouses. I believe uh, all discipline services should uh, consider this uh, case. So I would like to know the uh, criteria for providing the married uh, discipline services staff with quarters. Well, the uh, immig SIO senior immigration officer in question did not uh, was not uh, is not entitled to quarters because uh, he's uh, on new t on the new t terms and he would get a uh, cash benefit. So can is the uh, cash allowance available while he's waiting for quart for quarters or uh, it's not the case on the question of uh, parking spaces. We uh, provide the number as uh, as uh, required under the Hong Kong Planning Standard and Guidelines. There will be a transport panel meeting two weeks down the road, uh, which would be on this on these uh, matters. Uh, we have uh, been. Uh, Providing the maximum number according to the guidelines. Please explain to, uh, to the PWSC why there are only seven motorcycle parking spaces. According to Hong Kong Planning Standard and Guidelines, uh, the number of, of flats, uh, the distance to a uh, public transport facility such as a railway station, will be taken into account. In uh, assessing the needs, we well, should look at the actual need. Uh, would the would quarters be made available to same-sex couples? Well, the CSB is uh, looking into the judgment. The bureau will handle this, so this uh, matter will be handled by the bureau, and I will reflect uh, the members' uh, views to CSB. So that they know that uh, Mr. Chan has raised uh, these uh, issues. Ms. Elizabeth Kwok, we know there's been a shortage of uh, discipline services uh, quarters uh, for the FSD. The shortage is more than a thousand, and this project will provide 648. So there still be a big shortfall. So we are all supportive about building. More discipline services quarters. Well, uh, it's not a uh, controversial. There's no local uh, opposition to such uh, projects. Since this is not controversial, and uh, local residents are in support of providing more, can more uh, quarter units uh, be provided under the project? I thank uh, the member for her concern about the shortage of uh, departmental quarters. Well, this is directly related to the shortage of land for residential development. And of course, uh, the community will have to look into how the shortage of uh, sites can be addressed. For us, when we have a site for the departmental quarters, we'd like to build more units. And on this point, we are with Miss Elizabeth Quart, but uh, our wishes apart. We are the subject to land use uh, parameters. We have uh, increased the building height. And there are other factors to consider. For example, the c compatibility uh, with the environment, uh, impact on the uh, on tr 
transport, on tra tra traffic, and so on. We will try to make the best use of what we've got, and and uh, as long as the requirements are met. We've asked the discipline services to look into uh, their own land size. For example, for some ambulance uh, depots, can uh, quarters be built on top of the depot, or can we have some? Uh, on top of uh, fire stations, and if they have new facilities, uh, can uh, the site be used for quarters at the same time? We have asked all discipline services to, to consider the such uh, optimization uh, efforts, including the FSD. According to some fire officers, for this site. There will be uh, four special uh, bus trips: two in the uh, morning, two in the evening, for the offices. Otherwise, they will have to go to one pole road to 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 get uh, public transport. Uh, with uh, more the departmental quarters built here, are you going to improve the uh, public transport there? Well. Thank you for your question. We're going to look into this. F from this uh, departmental quarters, they can walk to the uh, Hang Hao Bar. It's just a five-minute walk, and also it's also a five-minute walk to Jiangguanlu Station. If they don't take uh, the bus, they can walk to the Lohas Bus. It's a twenty minute walk. I think many private uh, residential developments uh, where you have people uh, walking for twenty minutes uh, to a, f a railway station. I used to live in a private uh, residential development and I walk uh, f thirty minutes to. to to a, a railway station, but we'll see what we can do when the project uh, is completed. All right, uh, it will be better to have more bus stops. Well, the building height has been uh, increased from uh, 40 to 52 meters with the approval of the town planning board. The question is why fifty two meters, not sixty two meters? It's uh, just uh, opposite the tr uh, training school. Well, we pay a visit and we did, uh, had a look at the site. Is the uh, building heights related to the uh, fire and uh, ambulance services academy? The, the the academy is just next to this side. Uh, is that what you want to ask? Have you finished? Two questions. We want to make the best use of the land available. We want to build more DQ units. When we apply for the relaxation of uh, building height. Uh, we have to uh, consider the views of the town planning board and uh, the residents nearby. Uh, the building height of the academy, FSD con academy, is uh, comparable, and uh, buildings in the surrounding area are also have a comparable building height. So we have to consider these factors. If we can uh, have a taller uh, building for the academy. I don't know whether it's possible. Now, maybe you don't want to have a taller uh, buildings than the academy. Uh, officers of FST have complained that they have waited for, they have to wait for a long time for quarters, and now you want to spend 
two billion dollars on the quarter projects. Are you going to have taller uh, buildings for the ac academy? Well, because you don't want to have quarter buildings taller than the academy, r right? Uh, maybe uh, you should give them some time to respond. It's not that we don't want a certain building not to be taller than their own academy, or because of the uh, perceived uh, status of a certain facility. That's not the case. We would uh, pay attention to local uh, geographical conditions in deciding what to do. Well, if that's the, uh, uh, an issue, that would be a big uh, problem. There's no reason why that they should consider this factor like that. Mr. Houghton Child, I welcome the, the government's uh, move to uh, build more departmental quarters. We know there's a still a shortage of uh, 1,500 units. And you are going to build more. So my question for the bureau or department is uh, whether you've got uh, new uh, some the programs in the pipeline to address the shortfall. And I have a question about this uh, surrendering the departmental quarters units. Sometimes. Uh, Units are returned to the FSD. Do the officers have difficulties in relocating to another quarters or to another accommodation? We have a plan that in ten years' time we would increase the number of units to two thousand and two hundred. There are eight projects in question. Five have been of. Have their fundings approved by the FC, and as for some, uh, the pro the, the uh, construction is in progress. This is the six in in the in the program, and there's another one in Chiwan San uh, the, for the CNE department. We plan to brief the uh, security panel panel in uh, next year. And there's another one in Chongguangno for the CNE department, which is under planning. I believe uh, we can uh, build uh, at least uh, 2,200 uh, units in 10 years' time. We believe we can uh, stick to that timetable. We can achieve it. And because of limited uh, supply of land, we have adopted different measures. To increase uh, the provision of uh, uh, quarters, we will look into various ways to increase the number. As regards units being returned from by some officers, well, such units will be uh, refurbished before they are allocated to other officers. For applicants or for uh, units approved and uh, rejected, but th there is a, a certain procedure involved in deterring the rejection. For example, once a, a unit is uh, offered and uh, rejected, there will be a cooling uh, period uh, before another offer is made, uh, so as. To, so, so that uh, other officers with uh, lower quartering points may be offered the units first. But mainly, the turnover of units uh, is slow because of the need to renovate some of the units before they are surrendered. Mr. Chow, I'd like to pick up on the last point. Under Secretary, you talk about 2,200 units in the coming 10 years. Now, according to the paper, we're still short of 1,500 units. So about the 2,200 units you mentioned, 
uh, is it only about um, units for the FSD? Is it correct to say that the shortage can be addressed? Now, I was referring to the DQ units for all discipline services, 2,200 units. I know that this is still uh, insufficient to meet all the needs, and we're still we're striving to uh, increase supply. No other members would like to ask questions on this item. I don't see anybody objecting, so uh, I suggest that this item can be submitted to the PWSC for discussion. So AOB, item, next item, nothing under AOB, so uh, meetings adjourned. Thank you. Thank you for working overtime.